Okay, as I said, today's uh, first plenary session, which is going to be moderated by me. For those of you that haven't met me already, my name is Dean Ray. The second plenary session, you'll be back in the capable hands of Nadine. But this time, we're going to look at developments across the Tasman. Now, we love to beat the Australians at rugby. I've got to get in an obligatory rugby reference, and I've done that now. But the thing that all Kiwis know deep at the bottom of their hearts is our relationship with Australia is critical to the success of this country. Australia is our largest trading relationship and it's our strongest trading relationship. Australia does something else that's also extremely important for New Zealand. Just across the Tasman, three hours away by plane, we have a very valuable reference point for thinking through how matters of commercial and financial policy get played out in a far bigger and arguably more sophisticated marketplace in New Zealand. And those issues of financial and commercial policy extend to payment system policy. And that's why I'm delighted to invite Chris Hamilton to the stage for his presentation. Chris is the Chief Executive Officer of the Australians, Australian Payments Clearing Association. And today, Chris is going to be talking to us about what APCA is on about over in Australia. So Chris, without further ado, over to you. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, closing the beginning of the end, I suppose, of the conference. So apologies for that. And feel free to nod off if your um, post-lunch um, torpor envelops you. Um, I I'm supposed to be talking about Australia, but this morning was so stimulating. And Steve, fantastic conference, by the way. Just beautiful collection of speakers. Um, so stimulating, the combination of the Chris Skinner, you know, you guys are all dead, but you don't know it yet presentation. <laughs> Um, which he does well, he gives great fear, um, uh, and I've, I've seen the best at it, you know, Dave Birch and, and, um, and Brett King, those kind of guys, um, always very stimulating, and yet you really have to unpack it and be careful about what it really means for your organisation and your business. And I'm going to hopefully help you a little bit with that today, just a little bit. Um, so I want to come at Australia a little bit sideways and talk about the themes of the conference and, and, and try and uh, knit a few ideas together. Um, there, so let, let's review what we've heard so far. We've, we've heard, you guys are all dead and don't know it yet, right? Um, we know mobile's the future, that, that's true. We know New Zealanders are absolutely crazy adventurers, or, or maybe just crazy. Um, and um, uh, we know we've got to have the customer at the centre of our thinking. I'm actually going to challenge that last one a little bit. I, th I think organisations that serve customers have to have their customers at the centre of their thinking. I completely get that. But right now, what we're doing is we're talking about the payment system in New Zealand, right? Um, this conference is organised by Payments New Zealand for its community to understand how the payment system is going to evolve in a broad sense. Lots of implications of that. But, but my suggestion to you is that the job of looking after the customer is for the organisations in the marketplace. Trying to sit down together and decide what customer, customers want is probably not a great idea because you've all got different customers and different focuses within that customer group. Very simply, we have markets to look after customers. Competitive marketplaces are the best way, bar none, to look after customers. You guys are all in competitive marketplaces. You know what that's like. I'm not going to lecture to you about, about competition. When we're thinking about the payment system as a whole, we have to step away from that and let the market do its job and think about what the market needs to do that job really well. So I want you to sort of step back, but not only from, from your customers, but also from your own organisations just for the next hour or so, and think about the payment system as a whole and what that really looks like. So a couple of really important points. I've got to find the green button now. Here we go. A um, couple of really important... So I've got a couple of slides that do what Chris was doing much better, so I'm not going to waste any time with those. Um, th there's a whole lot of stuff going on. You all know that it's really scary. It's very digital and we all have to change really fast. OK, we've got that. We can, we can now move on. Let's unpack that a little bit. Um, the couple of really important points about both Australia and New Zealand. Um, we have done the collaborative systemic bit of payments really well historically. This is a piece of McKinsey data which, which just tries to chart countries. And I'm sorry, New Zealand's not on their list. I don't know why that is. We should write to them or something, I think. But, but um, 
you know, what it's trying to do is say, where is the automation level? And I can guarantee you New Zealand will be more towards the top right-hand corner than Australia is, right? You use checks less um, uh, and your share of electronic, so your share of electronic chess is going to be north of us uh, and your use of cards is, is heavy. So um, I, I'm assuming you're absolutely going to be uh, well and truly up towards the right. And so as a measure of how well uh, digitised or automated the economy is, um, we're, we're doing very well historically, and, that, and that's a product of getting the systemic essentials right. So don't, the first thing to say is don't be too distracted by all of the really exciting, interesting things that are happening at the customer, pace, uh, customer face. They're, they're important. They're really important for the businesses of your companies. But if we're thinking about the system for a while, you've got to get the basics right. You've got to get the rails to work well. And we're starting from a good place, both of us. A couple of reinforcing points on that. Um, Australia and New Zealand um, both have heavy usage of electronic payments. This, this is um, data from um, the Findex work that the World Bank did, I think, with the, the um, Gates Foundation as well, um, where they're just trying to survey what it was that made for good payment systems. So some of that uh, digitised economy stuff that you heard um, Constantine talking about, I think, is based on this finding about getting the basics right. Um, use of electronic systems, uh, transaction accounts. Australia and New Zealand are amongst the most heavily banked populations in the world, bar none, right? So we've got 19, you know, pretty much everybody over the age of 15 has a bank account. Um, you might be surprised, no, that's not true in the States, it's not true in the UK, it's absolutely not true in many, many of the developing countries. And, and why is that important? Well, it's good for banks, right? But more importantly, the bank account is the access point for the entirety of the payment system, at least in the traditional way of thinking. So when you start listening to those concerns around the digitisation and the disruption of the payments environment, you need to carefully split out two quite different types of disruption. They're both important, but they have very, very different effects. One is disruption of the traditional relationship with the customer, which is going to be a worry for your, your own company as it, as it works out how to serve its customers better. That doesn't touch the basic rails of the payment system. So many, many of those disruptive elements that Chris was talking about are in that category. They may be a big concern for your particular company. They're not systemic. A couple of those, though, are really systemic, right? So, that, so the ones to, that, that worry me, because I you know, live my life worrying about the payment system as a whole, are the, are the underlying systemic ones. Bitcoin is a very interesting example of that because it essentially bypasses the underlying rails. And there are a few, but actually only a few, examples of that in the digital economy, which we should have a think about. Um, again, it's not a matter of being afraid of them, it's a matter of understanding the broader implications and what that might mean in the long term. Um, okay, so the Australian bit. Uh, you might have seen this graph before. We use this quite a lot. This is, this is um, number of payments per head of population um, in different categories, a and uh, it just gives you a general trend line. A couple of things to note about that for a New Zealand audience. As you might expect, um, debit cards, crazy, popular, um, going berserk. The reason why that's happening in Australia, or the biggest reason why that's happening, is actually competition. Because um, the international card schemes introduced that, in fact, they had debit cards for a long time, but the um, the aggressive competition in debit cards only started back in the sort of 2006, 2007 uh, type region, at the same time as which the domestic debit card system, um, FPOS, um, essentially commercialised. So one of the things we did at APCA was we said, you know what, this is going to be a competitive marketplace. Um, we are either, that means we're either not going to be able to continue to do a nice utility debit card system, which we've done historically, or it's going to have to commercialise and compete. It can't actually stay the way it is. And so, um, you know, working again with the membership of APCA, the result of that was a new company, completely hived off and separate from APCA, which is now the competitor uh, in the card space amongst all the other card schemes in that debit card environment. And that competition is aggressive. Um, it, it's uh, doing a great job for customers in the sense of bringing new products, innovation, lots of exciting new things. That's a really good thing. But again, my theme, the market is delivering the competition from a systemic point of view, right? A um, couple of things to note. BPAY down the bottom there, um, chugging away. Now bigger than checks. That's like a big milestone for me, right? Um, BPAY doesn't, I, I don't think you have any equivalent here, do you? Um, 
uh, it, it's a, again, it's an industry-owned uh, organisation but has had to sort of quasi-commercialise over the years because it's operating in a competitive marketplace. Um, and uh, the secret of BPAY is the merchant number. This is an important point about networks. So uh, um, what you can do is on any financial institution in Australia, you can pay uh, any bill as long as they give you their merchant number. And nearly all bills, I knew they'd reach critical mass when my kids' school started sending home you know, the, the account and the tuck shop stuff, right, uh, with a BPAY payment on it rather than, you know, writing out a cheque. So, so that's absolutely reached critical mass in Australia and, and, and works extremely well. Um, but in other respects, that picture is quite um, similar to a lot of other developed economies. Um, cards are doing extremely well. Our electronic payment system, perhaps not quite as successful as yours, is nevertheless, this is the direct credits and direct debits, certainly doing just fine. Um, and yet, we're in the process of changing everything. So you might sort of be wondering exactly why we're doing that, and maybe that's what we should spend the rest of the time talking about. So, um, again, please remember that we're talking about the system as a whole. We're not trying to talk about individual competitors in the system or the way the marketplace works. We're trying to get the best efficient framework within which you guys can serve your customers. My, my proposition to you is that the most important thing about a payment system is that thing at the bottom that actually I've heard very few people talk about at this conference. And we'll get to why that, that, that's probably happened in a second. It's all about reach. Payment systems are networks. Networks um, have value in direct proportion to the number of nodes on the network. And that's a piece of microeconomic sort of truth, if you like, right? It doesn't matter how fantastic the interface is if not enough people are on the network. It also doesn't solve your problem if you have the most secure and, and reliable network in history, if not enough people are on the network. The heart and soul of networks has to be their reach, their ubiquity. The reason why we don't think about that much in Australia and New Zealand is that because we're heavily banked populations and because our payment systems are well developed, we take reach for granted. Nearly everybody does have access to nearly all the payment systems. But you only have to look at uh, the, pre the presentation we had before lunch, Constantine, to think about the importance of reach in a context where that doesn't happen. The big implication for digital disruption in, at this payment systems level is that that reach might be lost. So that instead of having a few payment systems that everybody has access to, we have many, many payment systems that only some people have access to. And what are the long-term implications of that? So there's a really big challenge in the middle of this. Um, I think Bitcoin's great, right? I think it's brilliant blockchain technology, absolute genius. My worry is not whether Bitcoin takes off or not. My worry is whether there are 150 Bitcoins or 1,000 Bitcoin types of Bitcoin, right? And there are already at least 150 different cyber currencies. Uh, every time I see an article on this, that number changes, so I've really got no authority for, for that number, uh, other than there are a lot of them and a new one seems to turn up every day. That's actually the, the systemic problem here. If we have many, many different payment systems and all of us are connected to some of them, we have what you might call a balkanisation of the payment system. It, it all gets split up into chunks and you can, you can have beautiful seamless pay, payments as long as everyone's on the same network. But if, they, if I'm on one network and you're on another network, then we're not going to be able to do a payment through that system. Um, I was in uh, uh, the US earlier this year, and, and I feel that very strongly about the US marketplace. On the one hand, you've got a whole, you know, they've got 13,000 banks there, right? You've got a whole bunch of regional banks saying, what's wrong with checks? You know, checks work fine. Um, uh, you know, they, are, they produce half the world's checks. And at the same time, you've got the Silicon Valley guys going, no, no, here's my new digital currency. You know, again, you guys are dead, you just don't know it yet. So, you know, there's this real um, lack of um, alignment between those two lines of thinking. And I, I think the big, the big problem is, in the US, the, the, the basic utility payment networks are the only ones that reach everybody. So cards and checks, basically, and cash, and that's it. Um, even the, the uh, ACH system, the equivalent of our direct entry, is not something that you can reliably, as an ordinary individual, go online and, and reach every other bank account with. It doesn't work that way in the US, right? So, th so the big sort of hidden problem is this reach issue about making sure the networks are as ubiquitous as they can be. 
So um, we've got innovation coming at us with a fire hose. We've got this big challenge about reach and ubiquity. Um, how do we have our cake and eat it? How do we get all the innovation and competition and the good services that leads to for customers while still having the reach, having, um, making sure everybody can connect to everybody else? Because without that, we're not going to have the outcome that we really want. Um, so I'm going to talk to you now. I'm going to try and give you a one-page picture of everything that's happening in the payment system in Australia. Kind of ambitious. Um, and someone said to me just before I came on that it looks like a rugby union coach's playbook. I don't know whether that's a good thing or not. But anyway, um, there are three key themes um, to take out of this. And so this is kind of take-home message time. Um, uh, to, to, to have your cake and eat it, to have the competition and innovation, but also the ubiquity and reach that you want, you need enhanced infrastructure. We need to rebuild our basic rails. Always hard for any one bank to talk about, but has to be done sooner or later. You need to have an effective environment for competition. So that means understanding where you want competition and sometimes actively taking steps to promote innovation and competition in a particular um, area, um, in a particular type of activity. And third, and, and uh, most important, you need some strong systemic direction. So you need somewhere, some venue, and uh, APCA is one of them, Payments New Zealand is potentially another one. Um, so in other countries, it's the government that does this. You need somewhere where you can sit down as a community and go, you know what, that's competitive, we want competition there, and this is basic rail stuff, we want that to be done in a ubiquitous, completely reliable way. So the way you have your cake and eat it is by being really clear where the competition is and where the, uh, where the collaboration is needed to deliver the basic set of rails. Let me show you what I think, what, what that kind of means in Australia. Okay, so we're starting with um, the, the key systemic entities, if you will. Now, I haven't put up here anybody who's in a competitive environment. And for me, that includes, obviously, all of the financial institutions and other payment providers, but also most of the payment networks that we're familiar with because they are increasingly competing with each other. So Visa, MasterCard, Amex, uh, even BPay, all of these guys are living in competitive marketplaces. They're really important, critical for our health, but in terms of broad systemic direction, we want to focus for a moment on the stuff that's basic infrastructure here, right? Um, so I put APCA in the middle. Sorry about that. It's sort of um, kind of arrogant, I know, but it just otherwise the slide doesn't work. You'll see in a second. Um, <laughs> um, but, but let's talk about the top two first. Australia unusually has a payment system board. It has a, a body within the Reserve Bank that has specific statutory responsibility and quite a lot of power in relation to payment systems. Doesn't like using that power. It's only taken the cudgel out of the case uh, once, really, in, in all its time, uh, which was on interchange fees, and many people here would know a lot about that story. Um, but uh, the fact that it has that power, it has the ability, if it really needs to, to direct how payment systems work, means that the industry plays with it in a completely different way than in other countries. So um, that's a strong driver to collaboration and, and, and props to the Reserve Bank and the Payment System Board for using that power so rarely and, and instead seeking to work with and influence and coordinate with the industry. And that's generally speaking what they do, and they do it pretty well. Um, at the same time, for political reasons in Australia, um, we have a financial system inquiry, which is a you know, whole of... Um, government whole of economy review of what's going on. A part of that is payment systems. Um, uh, uh, Murray, the, the chair of that inquiry, is very interested in payment systems because of the technology implications, so it's digital, sexy, interesting stuff. Uh, and so we, we're likely to have some quite significant direction in terms of payments coming out of government policy via the FSI. As well as that, there's a cyber currencies inquiry going on right now in, in, the, in the Senate. So. Um, you know, there's a lot of government policy to take into account as we go along. Down the bottom are uh, the two, um, from my perspective anyway, the two key basic bits of industry framework apart from APCA. Um, the new payments platform, you'll all have heard something about at some stage. Uh, APCA is sort of the arms and legs of it at the moment, but it will be a, a separate legal entity, um, obviously with quite close relationship to APCA. It's not intended to be a new competitive payment system. It's really important to understand that it's designed to be a basic bit of rails for Australia and not to compete with other payment systems. So it'll be open to everybody. Anybody who wants to come along and, and put a new payments infrastructure New, new payments overlay service on top of that, 
or, or use the, uh, the basic set of rails can do so, including existing competing payment systems. Um, and I'm going to not say any more about the new payments platform because the next half hour is devoted to that, so you'll get a bit more detail on that in a second. The Australian Payments Council is a directional body. So this is a negotiated outcome between the Reserve Bank, the Payment System Board and APCA to try and get a stronger sense of strategic direction in the payment uh, system in Australia. So it's, you know, the great and the good. It's the senior people in payments. Uh, they've had one meeting so far. We've only just got going uh, in October. And the whole point of that is to build a, a shared sense of what we, what we really want to achieve in a broad sense in Australia. And APCA, of course, is just kind of the arms and legs for all of this sort of stuff. So we're going to take direction from all of these different bodies in terms of getting stuff done in the payment system. So we're the sort of Mr. Do-it bit of it. Okay, so those three themes, enhanced infrastructure, effective competition, strong systemic direction, um, I just want to give you the key points on those. And I realise I'm starting to run slightly short of time. Um, so um, if this is, gets a bit bewildering from here, apologies. You can get the slide and study it later. I'm just trying to get on one page the key themes that are important in Australia right now. Um, in, the, in the category of enhanced infrastructure, there are three things that are worth worrying about and thinking about. Um, having a new basic set of rails is probably the most important, and that's actually what the NPP is about. So watch this space, listen to the next half hour. Um, that there are two other issues that are important there. One is digital identity. Now, I don't know whether you've ever heard a bloke called Dave Birch talk about digital identity, but, but this is a really useful and interesting thing for us all to grapple with. How do we um, allow people to live their lives in a fully online digital world and still authent authenticate themselves to each other? And there are very big privacy issues with that. You don't want a single central Australia card or sole digital identity. That's a really bad idea. You want to know just enough about someone to be satisfied that they are who they say they are for the specific purpose that you're dealing with. So if I just want to be paid by someone, all I want to know is that they have that money and that they're entitled to give it to me. I don't want to know how old they are. I don't, don't, don't want to know where they live, you know, uh, or anything like that. So digital identity is really important um, issue that, that basic payment infrastructure is going to have to grapple with in, in the coming years. Um, cyber security equally, we've heard a lot about the hacks of um, databases, um, the security of, of, of the environment, really important issue which is um, now being grappled with by the Australian Payments Council. So that's my, this is the beginning of the playbook, see. Um, digital identity, uh, very much a, a new payments platform concern, it's going to have uh, an addressing database in the middle of it. Um, important for government policy. Um, obviously, I, I, my expectation is we'll get some recommendations on that out of the financial system inquiry. And the Payments Council has, has singled out cyber security of one, it's one of its first two big issues. Okay, competition. Um, so this gets a little bit more complicated. Um, cyber currencies, you've already heard a, a, a bit about. Um, very um, important to grapple with the implications of that in terms of competition in the marketplace. Um, as I say, how do we build them into an infrastructure which still has that reach outcome we're looking for, but we get the benefit of all that clever blockchain technology? Really hard question, and no one's got a good answer yet, right? Um, scheme competition is a growing, perhaps I would say the growing phenomenon of payment systems around the world. We have seen the gradual conversion of what used to be regarded as utility payment systems into competitive organisations that advertise and, and sell customers stuff and compete for your business. Uh, more and more, and that's uh, a trend that is going to be uh, universal in the next few years. So get used to the idea that networks can compete with each other uh, as well as individual organisations. Um, and pre and post disruption, I think you got that from Chris in, in spades. Many, many new organisations, a plethora of new people seeking to insert themselves into particular points in the value chain and, and add value or compensate for a weakness in the system. Uh, and, and essentially eat someone else's lunch. And that's really healthy. That's a very good thing and we can learn a, a, a lot from them. Um, you don't want that to happen in a way which compromises the, either the reach of the system or the reliability and integrity of the system. And so the, the conundrum from a systemic point of view is what are the rules that the minimum standards we set to allow those guys to innovate and do fantastic things while still not stuffing up the essentials, right? Um, government policy is very engaged in that. Um, uh, App, App, App has got a focus on cyber currencies at the moment, trying to understand their implications for the broader payment system. 
Uh, the new payments platform has a thing called overlays, and again, watch this space in the next half hour. Um, there's a couple of older issues uh, packed up in there, which are part competition, part systemic direction. The interchange fee debate. We have this over and over again. Every few years, we have a big fight about whether interchange fees should be regulated, on, and if so, how. Australia was a world leader in the interchange fee regulation stakes. A dubious honour if ever there was one. Um, so uh, that's still live. The RBA has signalled that it's going to um, have a look at interchange fees in the next little while, partly because of quite rapid change in the, in the payments market. So three-party schemes like Amex are converting to a significant degree into four-party schemes because the Amex cards are now being issued by banks and that kind of stuff. So that has all sorts of implications for interchange fee regulation. Um, regulatory perimeter is a harder concept. How do we allow people to innovate around the edges of the payment system but step in to regulate them when we need to? So you don't want to stultify the innovation, but you actually don't want them also to have a free pass relative to the existing players. There needs to be a level of fairness there. Striking that balance is a conundrum all around uh, the world. And um, uh, in Australia, the financial system inquiry is very interested in the idea of how you can uh, allow light touch regulation that only steps in when it needs to in, in that space. So if you're interested in seeing, obviously time doesn't allow me, but uh, there's, there's going to be some interesting stuff coming out of the financial system inquiry, which, by the way, reports at the end of this month, so it's close now. Um, okay, and strong systemic direction. So um, the heart and soul of good systemic direction, there's two pieces. One is public policy. One is the government needs to say clearly what it thinks should happen. And the good part about Australia is we have a payment system board that is able to give a clear steer on what the government policy on payments should be. Many countries in the world don't have that, and I think in a modern economy, you kind of need the government to tell you what it wants in terms of economic outcomes, and then let the industry work out how it's going to deliver it. So government asks the questions on policy, but industry supplies the answers. Uh, that in Australia, I think, works reasonably well after a number of false starts, um, and, and so uh, the payment system board and the relationship with the, with the industry is very important there. Um, the fundamental regulatory framework is being looked at by the financial system inquiry. Actually, that's going to get a big tick. That's my prediction. So I, I don't think the financial system inquiry is going to recommend any significant changes to the basic regulatory framework uh, in Australia. Now, that's, I'm out there now. That, that might well be completely wrong in, uh, by the end of this month, but we'll, we'll see what happens. <laughs> um, and then the third and, and many ways the most important piece from my perspective is you need some kind of published, well-consulted, well-documented plan for what the payment system is going to evolve towards over the long term. Where's the, com where's the area for competition and innovation? Uh, how are you going to ensure the stability, reliability and reach? Um, Payments Council is just embarking on that. It's going to take us quite a bit of time. Um, there's going to need to be a lot of consultation, but it's really important that you have one. Um, the UK sort of led the way with this. They've, they've got their own uh, payments plan, which has a, a unfortunately fairly checkered history in terms of acceptance. Uh, but I do think, hard as it is, the more you can do this, the better value you get. So that's it. Let's put it all together and get the confusing diagram. There we go. That's the Australian payment system on one page. You saw it here first. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Chris. Thank Have we got any questions from the floor for Chris? Looking out there into the darkness, there has to be one. That was a bit bewildering, so I'm not surprised if you You've got an Australian on stage at your mercy. <laughs> you must have a question. <laughs> we have with Steve. Oh, just uh, to correct the issue around Square. Oh, yeah, yeah, good point. Thank you for reminding me, uh, Steve. So yesterday, something was said to the effect of Square has failed in the Australia, something like that. Wrong, 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 wrong. Don't, don't listen. This is incorrect. Um, Square are enthusiastically pursuing opportunities in the Australian marketplace. It's not for me to you know, talk about what they're doing or why they're doing it. It would be completely wrong to suggest, because I think it was even suggested that the Australian banks were stopping them or something. Yeah, that sounds kind of illegal, so I don't think we'd be doing that. Um, <laughs> um, uh, that, that really is so far from the case, I don't even where to, know where to begin. So just. Put that from your, from your minds. Any other <laughs> questions from the floor for, for Chris? 
Chris, I have one for you. I yeah, agree sure. entirely with your description of the network effects and why reach is so important. What, in your view, explains the difference between how New Zealand and Australia are heavily banked and you, you go to the United Kingdom and there are a significant number of people who don't have bank accounts? What's, what's the underlying difference? So that, that's, a very, uh, that's a very interesting question and I'm not sure I have a complete answer for you. I do, however, think that um, one of the things that affects the UK banking system is a cultural assumption of free banking. So, so there is an assumption over there that a bank account should be completely free. The price you pay for that is that not everybody is going to be reached out to by the banks. So if they have to give the, the, the account free to someone, they're not necessarily going to go after the guys who are obviously loss-making propositions from their perspective. So actually, conversely, freeing up that environment, perhaps paradoxically, freeing up that environment, allowing competition, allowing bank accounts to be tailored so that there are limited service bank accounts that are really cheap to run, uh, and linking them to other products, you know, allowing um, banking to be not free but co connected with a social network, for example, all those things are, are things which would help in terms of building up that um, ubiquity of bank accounts. Um, and just uh, lest I'm misunderstood, when I say bank account, I really should say banking account. It doesn't have to be a traditional bank and increasingly it won't be. Uh, PayPal is looking more and more like a bank and there are people who live their lives out of their PayPal accounts and that's a good thing, you know, we, we can absolutely learn from um, thinking about this in a broader way, but you do need to have your repository of value well connected to the payment system. That's all I mean by a banking account. Great, okay, thank you. Any other questions? If that's it, Chris, thank you. Oh, we do have one more question down in the front. Um, I wonder if you could just, uh, thanks. Um, I wonder if you could just um, unpack your concerns around the proliferation of cyber currencies a little more? Yeah, so it, it, it's essentially a reach issue. So I, I recognise there are lots of other things people worry about with cyber currencies, you know, um, legality and, and reliability and all those sorts of things, and, and they may or may not be problems depending on the cyber currency. I've got a sort of more basic issue, which is if there was one Bitcoin and we all decided to use it, that would solve my reach problem. But that is almost... Uh, it's unimaginable. It's, it's not going to happen that way. If there are 150 Bitcoins, uh, and I use Bitcoin but you use Ripple or, or any of the other uh, examples, then that, does, that means we can't pay each other, at least not within the system that we, that we commonly have. So it's a very basic concern which says the fundamental attribute of payments, its reach, is failing at that point. Um, so it's... it's, it's you know, so there are ways of solving that problem. I'm not suggesting that you can't have 150 digital currencies. But if you do, they're all going to have to be inter interoperable in some way if it's going to work for the economy in the long run. So that's the challenge. What are the basic rails? Okay. Chris, thank you very much for your presentation. Most Pleasure. interesting. Thanks.